honor to have Professor Charlie Marcus here today. Um, Charlie attended Stanford University as an undergrad and received his PhD from Harvard University and was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. I guess he liked Stanford, so he went back there, became a faculty in physics from 92 to 2000, then came back to Harvard, was a faculty there for 11 years to 2011 before uh, he moved to the Innsbruck Institute and University of uh, Copenhagen, where he currently serves as a director of Center for Quantum Devices. He's also a director of Microsoft Quantum Lab uh, in Copenhagen. Um, Charlie is a well, member of National Academy of Sciences and a foreign member of Royal Danish Academy of Science and Letters. Um, he's a fellow of American Physical Society, a fellow of American Association Achievement of Science. Um, he had, he's known for many uh, different um, fields in this matter and quantum uh, systems. So his contributions to mesoscopic physics, quantum Hall effect, the spin transfer, the spin qubit, and um, are all noted. Uh, but he recently has been very interested in hybrid semiconductor, superconductor systems that uh, you can engineer a topological system with applications in quantum computing. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Charlie. Please. Thank you. You didn't mention that, that, uh, that you were my postdoc for a little while. That was so we, we, have, we have a deep and good connection. It is a pleasure to be here, and, and um, New York is so great. <laughs> I mean, this department is this department is fun. I'm having a really fun time. Uh, but, but boy, late nights in... Uh, Late nights in New York City are really something to people. Uh, so thank you, Javon, for uh, Part of the, one of the consequences of, of, of this changing fields and institutions that I seem to have a habit of doing um, is that I'm always on a kind of a learning curve. So the, the, um, the good part of that is that uh, we're kind of gonna be on it together today. There's gonna be a lot of physics that I I don't know. That, I don't know why it's doing what it's doing, uh, and it might it might even be that other people do, but I just don't. Some nobody knows, and some I just don't know. The the down the, the, so that's maybe the downside is is that I'm not an expert in superconductivity. I'm entering the field of superconductivity. Um, the nice part is that you're kind of coming along on the adventure with me, and uh, you know it should feel like we're kind of. Um, both passengers in some vehicle that's going toward uh, the unknown. So uh, a big group of people uh, in Copenhagen mostly, and then you see some other names on there like like Javad's also, um, of people that I've worked with in the past uh, who have um, contributed mostly materials or uh, thoughts, and then a large group of theoretical physicists who have helped us understand what it is that we're doing, incompletely, I would say, um, uh, but uh, as, as the target moves. The title here is uh, more or less correct. The title that's on this, the screens as we go around the building is incorrect. That was a typo. This is not the king of particles. That would be, it's true that I, I now live in a monarchy, <laughs> but I still don't think of myself as, as a, you know, supporting that way, of the, that, that, that notion. The idea of encoding information as a kind of a backdrop to a, a kind of quantum information processing, and this will not be a quantum information or qubit or a topological quantum computing talk. This is a physics talk. But there is a kind of a background. And the background is that information encoded in a topological structure like a knot uh, is pretty robust. And, and, and you can see that whereas long ago parchments that were uh, used for taking notes have long since decayed in the dirt of history. Um, the, these are still being dug up containing all of the accounting information uh, in very nice, in fact interestingly um, from, um, uh, from the uh, 4,000 year old technology in decimal form they were used. And the knots stay. And uh, I want to kind of, I want to kind of be motivated for a quantum version of the idea that tying something in a knot is a pretty robust way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 
holding it there. And I thought also, you know, there was another analogy that I gave once upon a time, and I couldn't find the view graph, but I like the analogy. And it's those of you who go hiking up in the woods, and at night, at least in California where I grew up, uh, you have to you have to tie uh, your food up in the tree. I don't know if anyone's ever done that. We we pull it up in the thing, and then and then I'm, I'm have a quiz for you because I do it my way. At the bottom, after you've tied, pulled it up into the tree, you wrap the rope around the tree, and you tie it in the most complicated Byzantine knot you can think of because you don't want the bear to be able to untie the knot. So you figure that there's some, some kind of IQ threshold that the bear will probably, not, if it's a very complicated knot, the bear will not be able to, you know, you just do it like one slip knot, probably the bear will be able to get that thing out. Well, let's think of the decohering environment of quantum mechanics a bit like that, which is, that uh, the measurements that take place in quantum mechanics um, are ab about as smart as a bear. And if you tie in a very sophisticated way a knot in the rope, uh, that the bear or the environment will not be able to measure the knot character and remove the knot. So that's my visual image of what quantum measurement is, is a bear trying to get your food out of the tree. But in the long history of computation, it's probably worth remembering that the first programmable computers that used punch cards to encode information was actually a weaving machine that did exactly what we would like ultimately to be able to invent in the quantum domain, which is to have a kind of programmable machine that can weave only now what it's weaving is instead of thread, it has to weave the time history of particles that have non-abelian statistics that remember who's gone around who and encode the information. And the robustness of that encoding would hopefully be as robust as the creation of fabric in which the time history of which needle went around which other needle to make the colors originally encoded in the punch cards has a long-term stability in the woven fabric that might even last longer than the punch cards that made it. So now we have to turn our attention to the quantum version of that same kind of problem. And so here's a statement of that, that same thing. The idea of quantum, topological quantum information is, is this. That a measurement that is performed locally on some quantum object cannot detect whether or not there's a global topological structure. And therefore, if it is not measured by a local measurement, it will not be reduced to a classical object. It can stay quantum mechanical. So the information encoded in knots should therefore be immune to local disturbances, local noise, or local measurement. And it's a hypothesis. You know, we haven't made a topologically protected qubit yet. We means our species has not made a topologically protected qubit. So all of this just sounds good on paper. And it seems, to, I mean, if you go the next step and do real theoretical physics on this idea, it seems to hold. But I would say that experiment has to be the arbiter of whether or not this is a really good idea or whether there's some bugaboo buried deep in this notion of topologically encoding information to prevent it from being measured by a local environment. Uh, and we'll hopefully find that out. So where might we look? This is now to the title of the talk. I want to start motivating the idea that the kinds of time history encoding particles that we might look for um, are not found among the everyday objects uh, that we encounter, neither bosons nor fermions, though they have different statistics upon their exchange, will remember if you try to weave a fabric out of fermions and bosons, when one goes around the other, uh, they seem to come back to the original uh, wave functions of the two particle wave function of one particle surrounding the other, because this is really just a double exchange. And the nice thing about minus one or plus one is that when you do them twice, they come back to one again. On the other hand, there's no rule that says that in a reduced dimensional system uh, that that has to be the only thing allowed. In fact, there's a kind of a logical argument in three dimensions that says that, that, can't, that there really can't be anything except um, abelian particles because the notion of surrounding something in three dimensions doesn't really make sense. Like you in the back row, I'm 
I'm, uh, I'm surrounding your head with my finger. You see, it doesn't mean anything for me to surround your head with my finger. It can be contracted to a single point. But in two dimensions, there's this unambiguous notion and if there were string hanging down under the table, the string would remember who went around who. In fact, it would be the basis of that kind of braiding. So at least if particles are confined to live in a two-dimensional universe, such encoding is mathematically, so you say mathematically possible. And then we have to ask whether or not such excitations or particles exist in nature. And it appears, at least, unless you work pretty hard by combining ingredients, uh, that the answer is no that you get fermions and bosons in reduced dimension. But there are some glimmers of ideas that would produce non-abelian excitations in reduced dimension, but you have to work for them. They don't, they don't come for free, and they seem to exist at low excitation energies, etc. So where would you look? Well, in the history of ideas, some have emerged where the so-called non-abelian, or the the, the exchange of, of particles remembers the sequence in which they were exchanged uh, are fa can be found by combining ingredients. One appeared around the year 2001. And in fact, we'll see that this era around the year 2000 was a kind of a magic time for the emergence of these ideas. Uh, this one from Alexei Katayev, a name that you've maybe heard in other contexts since then. He's now on the faculty at Caltech. He was then in the Soviet Union. Uh, well, no, he was in, I guess he was in Russia at the time. Uh, and already he recognized an interesting physical system in which a one-dimensional conductor, perhaps he was imagining a nanowire, uh, sitting on top of a superconductor and picking up superconductivity in the one-dimensional wire via the proximity effect. The proximity effect is if electrons can be exchanged into this one-dimensional conductor, it would pick up superconductivity. And in this one-dimensional system, uh, he recognized that there were two kinds of superconductivity that were topologically distinct. One, one later picking up the name of the topological superconductivity. And they were distinct in, in his particular model, which was a discrete state model, of how the states were paired. And in one case, uh, the pairing of these so-called Majorana excitations into individual electrons took the form of this kind of pairing, whereas the other ones were this other kind of pairing, <coughs> leaving an unpaired excitation residing at the ends of the wires. And he noticed in the analysis of this paper that those excitations at the ends of that one-dimensional chain in that particular mathematical model, which is pretty far from physics at this point, just a mathematical model, that those endpoint half electrons unclaimed by the intervening pairs would have a zero energy state that would have statistics that would follow the rules of braiding. That is, they would have non-abelian statistics. If you had three of them, you could wrap them around each other like you could braid three strands of hair, and they would be locked into a braided configuration. It was already recognized, because the field was already alive as early as 2000, that these so-called Majorana zero modes or Majorana operators uh, at these endpoints would be stuck at zero energy. They would be therefore robust to any kind of change. And what I mean by that is that if something is at some energy and you do something like bend it or squeeze it or heat it, you can change the energy of a state. If you change the energy of a state, you'll change how it evolves in time as it's moved. But if it's locked at zero energy, there's a symmetry that says that it can't go up or down because it's locked at zero energy. So any kind of perturbation of the system tend, won't tend to move it. It's locked at zero. So that zero was a very special thing. The non-abelian statistics were unobvious but emerged. And already, Kataev pointed out that such a system could be used as a qubit, a quantum bit, since it's intrinsically immune to decoherence. That is. You cannot tell whether or not the electron state is present or absent by looking locally at one of these two end states. You have to somehow combine them. And uh, there, there, I can draw it in a sort of a schematic like this, which is if those two Majoranas at the end of the wire can do one of two things if they are fused together and brought into proximity. And that is they can either become an electron or they can become the vacuum. 
But, it's, but the information is non-locally encoded. That is, there's no way to tell from just the examining of one of them whether or not when fused, they'll become vacuum or they'll become an electron. Great, so that anybody who looks there won't be able to tell whether this state or that state is present. So that was already understood at a theoretical level in 2001. It took another 10 years for how to make such a system in the lab was really thought about. Now, you could actually, it's worth pointing out, first of all, Kataya could not have done a better job of burying this thing for nobody to find. Than, I mean, not only publishing it in this journal, I don't even know what this journal is. <laughs> but, sec but it wasn't even in the journal, it was in a supplement to the journal. Uh, and it, it kind of came and went. <coughs> Moreover, the superconductor that was needed in order to proximitize the wire needed to be a so-called P-wave superconductor. It needed to be a spin-polarized superconductor, which happens not to exist, except, I don't know, maybe there's a uranium compound now that has, that has this property, or maybe not. But in any case, it wasn't like anybody had access to these materials. So the world goes to sleep and doesn't pay attention to this idea until 10 years later, when these two papers almost back to back uh, recognize that the, the proximity effect could be affected by an S-wave superconductor. You know, tin, lead, aluminum, every superconductor you know, uh, with a one-dimensional wire sitting on top of it would work fine as long as the wire had sufficient spin-orbit coupling that the bands of, of of the dispersion relation would be separated enough. And so here, drawn in this illustration, is the resulting band when you add the three essential ingredients, namely superconductivity, a one-dimensional system with spin-orbit coupling, and an external magnetic field applied transverse to the direction of the effective spin-orbit field inside of the wire, results in a band structure that looks a little like this Volkswagen symbol, the VW. And, and the important thing about this is, as opposed to simply spin lifting the, the, the two Cromer's pair inside with, uh, with the Zeeman field, if it has this shape, there's still enough S-wave character remaining that it can be proximitized by an S-wave superconductor. That is, if you just Zeeman split the thing so that this was spin up and this was spin down, that would be fine. You would have a spinless band, but that spinless band wouldn't be able to be proximitized by an S-wave superconductor. But because this thing is spin down when it's moving to the left and spin up when it's moving to the right. It proximitizes it with an S-wave superconductor and produces an effective spinless band. This spinless band is the essential ingredient for this Majorana zero mode. Now, why Majorana? I think that it's worth just, just one sentence about this. And, it, you know, it's an intuition, so it emerges from the mathematics, but I think that it's worth having an intuition, which is, What's a Majorana? Majorana was this, was this idea from, from Edouard Majorana in the 1930s, I guess, that uh, a particle could be its own antiparticle, which means adding the particle was the same as subtracting the particle. Well, in a way, we have that intuition almost for superconductors as it is. That is, electrons are paired inside of a superconductor. You add one electron to the system. It's an odd number of electrons. You add another electron to the system the two electrons fall into a condensate and kind of disappear. So adding that electron is sort of like removing an electron. So adding and removing are kind of the same. Now that would be strictly true, except for the fact that there's, they're spin paired, so that you have to add the opposite spin one. So it's not just like removing the first one, it's adding a different kind of electron for the second one. But if they were spinless, then literally adding the next electron that would allow them to pair would be just like taking that first one away. And all of a sudden you have a particle that is its own antiparticle. Giving and taking are the same operation. And that, are, that object, because it is neither an electron nor a hole, is forced to live halfway in between. It's zero energy, and it forms this, this zero energy manifold. And that zero energy manifold was the one that had these non-abelian statistics. And here, you have to apply a magnetic field. The magnetic field has to be sufficiently large that you enter this so-called topological phase. This is the one in which this separated Majoranas at the ends uh, uh, appears as the ground state of the system. And it requires a magnetic field. 
And look, it's a lot of magnetic field. It's a magnetic field in which the Zeeman energy exceeds the superconducting gap. This is big, bigger than one. That's normally the criterion for killing superconductivity. Normally, if you add enough magnetic field that the Zeeman energy exceeds the, the pairing energy of the, of the gap of the superconductor, you destroy superconductivity. But in the presence of strong spin-orbit coupling, that's not true. You can add enough Zeeman energy that exceeds the superconducting gap, and all that results is the topological phase. So, so far so good. And now the ingredients, and what I can add is that these papers did something even nicer, both of them, which is they actually plugged in the numbers. They took the materials like indium arsenide, indium antimonide, three five semiconductors that had strong spin orbit coupling, and said the gap that will emerge in a magnetic field in the presence of superconductivity will exceed the characteristic temperatures that you could easily achieve in the lab. Go for it. And we did. But it took that 10 years of turning this into kind of a concrete, experimentally realizable proposal before we went to work. I just want to add two things. One, what about these wires? Well, the wires are something that had existed before. Here I'm showing from the group in Copenhagen uh, the way they're made. Uh, it's a remarkable process. If you haven't seen this before, this is as surprising as anything, which is you, you go into a molecular beam epitaxy, a growth chamber filled with the gases of, in this case, uh, 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 indium and arsenic. You put a gold ball down on the surface of the wire. The gold ball catalyzes the crystallization. I can show you even a zoom in. Here's the gold ball catalyzing the crystallization of indium arsenide. And it just pushes the ball up into the air, rising up on this catalysis underneath it until you have this long one-dimensional wire whose diameter is set by the size of the ball. So if you want to learn how to do that, go to Javad and will show you. But, but it produces this one-dimensional perfect crystal, essentially perfect crystal, um, of indium and arsenic or indium and antimonide or, or silicon or different materials that can grow, catalyzed by the gold on top. So now, you know, you can go to town. You can, you can imagine if you were to grow these wires and make all of these things, then the non-abelian statistics would have in their heart the basis for some kind of information <laughs> processing where the time histories would be recorded. Now, I'm showing you this, and I'm not going to go through it because it is a cartoon, and nor do I know how to build it, nor does anybody know how to build it, nor will it probably end up looking like this. But this is notional. This was kind of the idea. The idea was that there would be, once you had all of these zero modes, this manifold of two to the n zero modes, they'd be all of the zero modes, each Majorana zero mode separated by these two. If you move them together, you could find out whether they were an electron, but otherwise they live at zero energy. And for every n Majoranas, you'd have a, you'd have a manifold that had two to the n states in it. And by doing these operations of moving them around each other, you move among this manifold of states. And that manifold of states was general enough. It wouldn't be a universal computer, but it could do operations that would be useful for computers. They're locked at zero energy. You stay away from the superconducting gap, and you live down here braiding. That was the notional idea in 2010 or something when people were starting to think about building this. The next important idea was what do you look for to find out whether you have actually made these topological objects. They're, they're not going to be red balls at the end of a blue wire. So you have to find what experimental probe shows you that there, are, that there is something there. And it's pretty straightforward given the discussion that we've had. When you add sufficient magnetic field that you enter the topological phase, there will be subgap in the superconducting object, a place where you can inject electrons. Single electrons can go in to the superconductor via the Meyer on a zero mode. That means that you can exchange one electron below the gap of a superconductor. Now, for those of you who work in superconductivity, that's not normally the case. Superconductors are great at conducting, but only pairs of electrons. If you try to inject a single electron below the gap, there's a gap. It won't go. If there's a Majorana, there's a state at zero energy at the end of the wire only, and that's where you can inject a single electron. And it didn't take long. I mean, it's really important to keep your eye on the time timeline here. Remember, 2010 was the idea, here's what you should build. 2011 was, here's what you should look for. In 2012, here's the paper. 
And the reason that I emphasize that was not certainly not to take anything away from Delft or Kaunhoven Group or something who did this, but in just the opposite would be to say, once the ideas were on the table, once somebody said, you know, if you put together these ingredients, you will make a, to a topological object, and here's what you'll see in an experiment, it went like boom, boom, boom. And, and that's good news, because you sometimes see in the press, the 80-year search for the Majorana is over, or, or something like that. And I think that that's just a wrong way to tell the story, because I mean, anything that takes you 80 years to find is probably not going to be the basis of like next year's technology. But in fact, it really was something like, put these ingredients together that have never, probably never been assembled together, S-wave superconductor, a one-dimensional wire, spin orbit coupling, and an external Zeeman field, and look for a zero bias peak between the superconducting gaps. And here at zero external magnetic field, measured by tunneling normal electrons from a normal piece of metal into one of those one-dimensional wires that has been coupled to a superconductor via a tunnel barrier controlled by gate voltages. You see nothing, you see a big dip, you go up in magnetic field, and all of a sudden this thing appears. Okay, it's not perfect, it doesn't persist, it kind of splits, it does something else, God knows what that X is. It, it does some other funny things, but as the Delft group said, and as we are surely saying to ourselves, well, what the heck is that? And that's exactly right. Wh where did this zero, very narrow, zero bias feature appear when you get to a quarter Tesla, which happens to be just about when the Zeeman energy matches the gap of the superconductor? What's that? And that was precisely this now, I would say, famous paper that, 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 that pre presented signatures, you know, not, not, not proved by any means, it's signatures of these Majorana zero bias. The next event after 2012 uh, happened, this one happened in Copenhagen, and I think that it's a really important one, and it, it, and it projects onto NYU in an interesting way, so we'll, it's, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a good local story in, in addition, which is that a young guy who was a, a postdoc of mine at the time, Peter Krogstrup, who's he's now become a professor in Copenhagen, was growing these nanowires just the same way as I described. Here's the wire, there's the gold ball catalyst at the end. And in the same MBE chamber, molecular beam epitaxy chamber, where he was growing these wires, he stopped the growth and he turned on the aluminum gun inside of the metal chamber. And he got the temperature just right so that the aluminum neither went down and stuck, nor did it do what it would do at high temperature, which would be ball up, because the aluminum likes itself more than it likes anything else. But find the right temperature, the right pressure, the right evaporation rate, and a remarkable thing happens. And here's a picture of that remarkable thing, which is the interface crystallizes. So here is aluminum and indium arsenide epitaxially matched. Now, if you haven't seen this before, you should be having a heart attack right now, because they're not, they're not lattice matched. They're not the same lattice constant. Why has aluminum crystallized with indium arsenide. And you can see, it found the angle. You see there's some angle in there that looks like that? And if it finds the right angle, that angle will match at the interface, and it'll crystallize if you get the, if you get the temperature right. You know, nature has a way of finding low energy configurations, and this one found this. So this was just a, simple, just a, just a discovery. And now, by the time we start making these same kind of I'll call them Delft geometries uh, uh, from that first paper. Here's a normal electron made out of gold. You inject it through a tunnel barrier, now into this proximitized superconducting wire. But now the proximity effect in the superconducting wire is from having put on two of the facets of the wire, epitaxial aluminum grown onto the wire. And you start to see data in these kinds of devices that really, you know, here's the experimental data. You see the, the level come down, it reaches zero, it goes straight, it starts to look an awful lot like what you expect theoretically. And you kind of would think, okay, game over. You know, that's that. Let's now move to the next chapter. It turns out there was a kind of another chapter in which a, a, a large group of theorists played a very important, although occasionally annoying, role in the community, which was to say, uh, we have generated a computer model that has produced a data set that looks pretty much like what you see in the experiment, 
only it's not a Majorana, so you can't yet conclude that this is that. Okay, fair enough. It was fun for the first, you know, like year or so. <laughs> and, uh, and then after that, it, it, it got a little tedious, but, but it played an important role. And it is, and it's one that I want to emphasize, which is just in case you're thinking differently, let me tell you how I think about this. I'm not in the proof business. I'm in the preponderance of evidence business. And so I can just take data and look at it and take the next set of data and look at it and take the next set of data and look at it. And when somebody says, but have you proved it yet? The answer will always be no. I'll tell you right now. So there will always be a paper that will say, I produced data that looks like do a next thing just for fun and then I'm going to change subjects. Uh, the Majoranas, as we learned from the original Kataya paper, interact with each other in an exponential way. They live at zero energy, but that's when they're exponentially far away from each other. So can we actually see what happens when we bring the Majoranas close? They're supposed to do a particular thing. They're supposed to split in energy exponentially with their distance. So that's a, you know, that's a next test to pass. So let's take one of these wires and instead of making a long wire with a myron at the end that we probe by ejecting electrons, let's put two of them close together as if, and again I'm being highly schematic here, as if they existed at the ends of this thing with the aluminum proximitizing it and we constrain the length with these tunnel barriers that we put at the end. And then we can make different length objects and see what happens when they live at the ends of the thing. And again, it's one of these proximitized wires with the aluminum grown on the outside. This is an old subject. So I show you an old paper from 1992, which was exactly this kind of system. And you see what they, how they termed it then. It was called an NISIN because the eyes were insulating barriers. So you have a normal lead, then a superconducting grain, then another normal lead, separated by tunnel barriers uh, in the insulating regime. And what happens experimentally? Well, there's a phenomenon for this isolated object called the Coulomb blockade. The Coulomb blockade says you only get transport through the device when it's energetically neutral as to whether or not you have one extra charge or not one extra charge. And those energetically neutral points have a funny pattern when this grain is superconducting. When it's superconducting and you put an odd number of electrons in, you have to pay the extra cost of putting the odd electron up above the gap. So there's an energy penalty for the odd electron relative to the no energy penalty for the even electron. Now assuming that the billion or so electrons that might reside on this island are exactly all paired up so that, so that it has kept careful track of whether it's an even or an odd number, you would get at the positions of the Coulomb blockade peaks at the degeneracies of these even and odd parabolas. <coughs> parabolas are simply the change the voltage and you get a parabolic dependence on voltage from the, from the, from the energy. Um, that the positions of those lines would go something like a big step for the even one, a little step for the odd one, a big step for the even one, a little step for the odd one. And that little step, big step would be the pattern that would tell you two things. One, that this model is correct of putting the odd electron in. And two, that that island has kept careful track of whether it's an even or an odd number, which is pretty surprising for a superconductor with billions of electrons in it to know exactly whether or not that number is an even number or an odd number. And you can even go a little further. This is from the, from the Saclay group, again, 1990s when, was when this stuff was going on. You could imagine even that the superconducting gap was so large that it exceeded the charging energy so that the odd parabola was actually up beyond the crossing point of the pair of even parabolas. And so you'd actually never get an odd occupied state. It was just energetically too expensive to ever put an electron up above the gap. So you would just go even to even to even, et cetera. Now, if you lower the energy of the odd state until it finally crosses that degeneracy point, and there's these two spots right there, then you get to this one that I illustrated before with a big step, little step, big step for even, little step for odd, big step for even, until finally you bring a state all the way down to zero. When the odd state touches zero, which would be our Majorana state, until they become evenly spaced again. 
Now, when they're evenly spaced, that means one of two things. Either you've destroyed superconductivity altogether, and there isn't any penalty for going in at zero energy because there's no gap anymore. Or there is a new state at zero energy, and you have to distinguish between those two. But this was 1990. So now let's do the same experiment with our Majorana quantum dot and turn on the magnetic field to try to enter the topological regime. First of all, at zero magnetic field, we have that situation where the energy is above the, the charging energy of adding one electron, and you find Coulomb blockade has 2e periodic. There is no little step. It's just 2, 4, 6, 8 electrons entering the device. Now you turn up the magnetic field to uh, 80 millitesla. This green parabola comes down. The green frame matches the green parabola. You get this little step, big step, and there it is, little step. This is at zero bias. So you can look at the finite bias too, but just for the moment, just look at the zero bias case. Little step, big step, little step, big step, etc. Indicating first that this indium arsenide proximitized <laughs> aluminum epitaxial shell has kept exact track of the even or oddness of the number of electrons. Good. Checkbox number one. Checkbox number two is that eventually with the magnetic field sufficiently high, you see not only structure indicating from these lines that there isn't just a continuum. It's not just being driven normal to have make this blurry, you know, continuous density of states, but that there's a continuous density of states, but that these are uniformly spaced, 1e periodic. You can see them borne out in these blue peaks. So sorry, sorry, the blue peaks are the 2e space ones, the red peaks are the even. Now, I said that they were evenly spaced, but of course, they're not evenly spaced. That wasn't our experiment. Our experiment was to move the Majoranas close together and see whether or not the energy lifted a little bit. So now we have to be a little more careful than to just say that they became evenly spaced. So let's look, as we turn up the magnetic field, there's 2E Coulomb blockade spacing, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 electrons, each in between making the Coulomb blockade. You turn up the magnetic field, and these things become 1E spaced almost 1e spaced. Let's carefully measure and average the spacings of the valleys. So there's the two, and then you get to this 100 millitesla scale, and they become 1e, almost, almost 1e. They overshoot, and they ring, and they oscillate with magnetic field. Now you just make dots that are different lengths, and you keep careful track of how the overshoot is activated as the dots get longer and longer. And you see, lo and behold, as you make the wire longer and longer, that the overshoot statistics follow an exponential dependence. Not only that, but you now start getting out the numbers. Every 250 nanometers, you get a 1E folding time. Every, every half micron is another factor of 10 in the, in the exponential suppression. So OK, so it passes another test. Now, the story can take one of two turns. You can say, I'm exhausted from all of these tests of whether it's a Myron or not. I'm exhausted or I'm bored or I can't justify putting another student on that project again or something like that. I want to build a qubit. I want to build a qubit. I want to build a qubit. And so then you get started. And, and this is a direction in which I'm not going to take in this talk, but I want to tell you about that direction. And there's a really nice paper from 2016 with the folks from our group in Copenhagen and the group of Caltech with Jason Alisea about how now that you have these topological superconductors and trivial superconductors, the topological ones are shown in, um, in orange and the trivial ones are shown in blue, that you can open and close these various barriers, initialize the Majorana state, so these two you can force to, to uh, to be the ones that would fuse into an electron. This one can fuse into a vacuum. And you can do that by, when these are closed, you could control the occupancy exactly. Then you open the barriers. The Coulomb blockade disappears because the barriers are now open to a continuum. But the parity is preserved. Whether or not it's an even number or an odd number is preserved. How can you preserve the parity if I've opened the thing up to ground? I've grounded it, for God's sake. You can't preserve the parity of an object when it's grounded. You can if it's grounded through a trivial superconductor. Because this thing only speaks 2e. 2e grounds this. No electrostatics. But it keeps the parity fixed. <laughs> With the parity fixed, I have enough information to make a qubit. I can initialize this side. I can initialize that side. I can open up the thing in the middle. And I can 
process around this parity. I can make a superposition of parities, and they're coupled by Majoranus, and I can make a qubit. And I want to suggest that you go read this because it's a long, intricate, beautiful story about how to make a qubit where parity represents the state of the qubit. And by using trivial superconductors, you preserve the parity while preventing any charging energy, which would do the measure. Now, to go build one of these things, I will tell you this is a complicated direction in engineering space. You have to put all these cutters in. It's easy to draw them in PowerPoint. <laughs> it's hard to make them. This thing is like an FET. It's like a field effect transistor that you have to cut the semiconductor with electrostatics. And this thing in the middle that you have to lift up this gate a little bit, that's a continuous field effect transistor that you have to change the superconducting coupling in the middle. So by the time you end up building all of these things, as well as the detecting of the charge, you end up taking one of these wires with epitaxial aluminum shown in blue, removing the aluminum judiciously in various places like here in the locations of the cutters, putting charge sensors on, putting all of this electrostatics on, and that thing is that. And that's the beginning of topological quantum information processing. Now, you might get a little scared, but I'll tell you that every other qubit is just as complicated. You want to build a spin qubit, it's going to look like that. You want to build my, uh, a transmon qubit, it's going to have a lot of complicated parts. Also. So we qubit folks have a big job in front of us, but you know they get simpler as you make realizations and as you learn to do things not using electrostatic gates necessarily. But I want to go a different direction. I should say, just before I go in that direction, here's a different paper from an author named Karzig. Again, um, uh, a lot of Microsoft people on here and, and you know, Copenhagen people, et cetera, which is once you're kind of there and you have a qubit working, or maybe I should say once you're there and you have a qubit working, how do you then turn it into a topological quantum computer to make the whole computer? Well, since I don't have any data to show you, it's not worth spending much of the talk talking about it. But it is interesting that if you are interested, you can go read. Here's all those Majoranas, all connected by all of those wires, and all of the gate operations that you need in order to do the computation. And, if the, and, and I want to emphasize for those of you who are particularly worried that because I, I, I work for Microsoft and this thing is sh all shrouded in secrecy about what we're doing, there it is. <laughs> you can go read about it. That's what we're trying to do. That's our plan. Doesn't, doesn't help you do it. <laughs> it's pretty hard. So, but, but, but this isn't, I, I don't want you to think that this is kind of a secret plan to build a topological quantum computer. It is a plan to build a topological computer, but it's not secret. It's right there. You can just go read it. It's in FISREV B. So, uh, I want to change the subject because that's about as far as we've gotten. And we have great plans, and we have a lot of people working on it, and it's interesting and complicated. It's kind of an engineering problem at this point. Like, I don't personally have any doubts that those are Majorana zero modes that are inside of that wire, but it's pretty hard to get all those choppers to work correctly and all of that stuff. And it may not be the right colloquium for a physics audience to hear about all those choppers, because it's just, it's a lot of fab and a lot of electrostatics and a lot of voltage control, et cetera. So instead, I want to change the subject to something new and I think cool, which is that this idea of non-abelian statistics arose twice, at least. In our, no, really it arose three times. And I think those of you who are old enough to have participated in the helium-3 physics of the 70s and 80s uh, would have remembered an earlier version even of non-abelian excitations in the vortex core of helium-3a. But leaving that aside, it more or less in the year 2000 arose spontaneously twice. And, uh, and that cool convergent history that I wanted to talk about. And it started in the so-called fractional quantum Hall effect, one of the most beautiful um, phenomena in condensed matter physics, or maybe even in all of physics, uh, which is illustrated by this. Uh, if you don't know how to look at it, it doesn't look very beautiful. If you don't look at it right, it just looks, so how many, I'm just get curious, for how many people does that thing look just like a mess? <laughs> Yeah, it just looks like a mess. It's just like a bunch of wiggly lines, like some kid drew it. But then there's all this symmetry that, that comes out when you start looking at it. Like, like, look at this thing, and you start moving symmetrically away from here, and all of a sudden these wiggles start. Just like down here, they move away and the wiggles start. Oh, and there it is again. 
Those wiggles, they stomp and start, and this thing is sort of just like that thing, only it's, this one's bigger, or this, this one's smaller, and this one's bigger. And then, oh my god, there's another one up here. So there's this internal symmetric structure that it's a little bit cramped because the data is not perfect, but you see these patterns inside of this data, and the 30-year evolution of this, of this problem resulting in many Nobel Prizes is, is really one of the great chapters of, of uh, condensed matter physics, and I would even say of physics in the 20th century. If you look at the features in these things, they have something in common, which is every time there's a zero of this feature, it's associated with a fractional filling, and the filling it has to do with how many vortices in the ratio to how many electrons there are in the system, because it's two dimensions. You can count magnetic field units and vortices. Every time there's a zero, it has an odd number in the denominator. Every time there's a non-zero, it has an even number in the denominator. The beautiful, intricate patterns inside of this thing. And that pattern maintains itself, except with one exception. And that one exception, which itself spawned an entire industry to figure out what's the physics of the exception, was this one right here. The physics of five halves. That's an even denominator. It's a two. And it's a zero. What the heck is going on when the entire rest of the diagram has every one of those zeros with an odd denominator except that one? Well. The understanding these days of what that five halves physics is, is a unique feature among that entire beautiful, fractal, fantastic pattern. And it is superconductivity. It's the, super con it's the superconducting condensate of the elements that are inside of this thing going around each other. They, at some magic factor, condense and superconduct. They pair and condense. But this thing is in a big magnetic field. So they're not condensing like spin up and spin down. Ah, they are our spinless P wave superconductor, the one that we had from Kataya back in the earlier part of the talk. These are spinless superconducting condensates. Where's the Majorana? It's in the core of every one of those vortices that condenses, and it holds a Majorana. That was the theory that came out in just about the same time associated with this famous paper and the work of Nick Reed, Reed and Moore, Moore and Reed and Green, et cetera, who said the following. If I now read it to you, it should just sound like familiar language from the stuff that we just covered before. Paired states, OK, now first of all, the title should make sense. Paired states of fermions in two dimensions with a breaking of parity and time reversal symmetry and the fractional quantum Hall effect. To conclude, so this is taken from the conclusion of the paper. To conclude, our main results are that P wave pairing, P wave pairing means it's spinless. Because if two things, to preserve the, elect, the symmetry of the electrons, if, they, if they're the same and you have to exchange them and get a minus sign because they're fermions, you better have one unit of, or odd number of units of angular momentum to give you the minus sign. So if they're spin polarized and there's no second degree of freedom to give you the, the, um, the uh, minus one from the exchange, if they're like this, you need the minus one from the angular momentum. So they have to spin. And they're spinning in the lowest angular momentum state, the P wave pairing. So to conclude, our main results are that the P wave pairing in a spinless or spin polarized fermions in the weak pairing phase leads to the properties found in the fractional quantum Hall effect and supports the idea of non-abelian statistics as a robust property, at least in the case of a pure system. Such statistics will occur for the vortices of such a P wave state in general charge superfluid. They also note that, by the way, this was also already noted in the, in the A phase of superfluid helium 3 some generation earlier. But the idea, once again, is that if you have a zero mode living in the core of a vortex, that those zero modes will have non-abelian statistics. And this picture from much later, this is an anachronistic picture that was just taken, sort of explains why, is that it, in order to take this half vortex the wave function has to have a branch cut that goes out to the edge of the sample. Well, the branch cut, which tells you that when you go around once, you either pick up a zero or, you know, or a pi uh, uh, phase, that branch cut means that that's the string hanging down. That says that when you start moving these things around each other, they remember who, how many branch cuts you crossed. 
So they're not just free independent particles, they're free independent particles with a string that goes out to the edge of the sample. And so they remember who crossed who, who, who crossed whose branch cut. And they can pick up minus signs that way. So this was all then understood, including their relationship to qubits, in a completely parallel track going down the fractional quantum Hall effect through Reed and Green and Ivanov and a whole other group of theorists who were thinking about this and then recognized also that this was a basis for topological quantum computing and robust qubits. Interestingly, right up into the modern times, this has now become the way in these two-dimensional superconductors of identifying whether or not this is a topological superconductor. How do you do it? You find a vortex, you go look in the core of a vortex with a tunneling microscope, and you see, does it have a zero bias peak? The zero bias peak is taken as experimental detection of Majorana modes in the core vortex inside of a topological insulator, this particular one. And this is now getting to be a pretty good industry. So now from 2000, what is it, 2018, this material is, is a uh, alleged topological material. How do you find out whether it's a topological superconductor? You go find a vortex. You look in the core of the vortex with a tunneling microscope. And you look to see whether there's a zero energy peak, just like you do at the end state of the nanowire. And that zero bias peak tells you, or is the, is the evidence, evidence for Majorana bound state in these iron-based superconductors, that it is a topological superconductor. Okay, good. So this is like this parallel development of approaches, each of them characterized by a zero energy state. In the two-dimensional systems, the zero energy state lives one at the perimeter of the sample, and the other in the vortex core, and in the other case, at the two end of the wires. It's as if you took the wire and spread it out and kept one end of the wire as the vortex core, and the other end became the edge of the sample. Now, the fun part which is I want to unify those two different views and sh show how they're one piece of physics. And I want to do it the following way. Let's go back to the original nanowire where we grew the epitaxial aluminum on the outside of the nanowire. And this time, when you turn on the aluminum gun, keep the stage rotating of the, of the growth chamber, inside the growth chamber, so that the aluminum goes all the way around the outside, forming a continuous band of superconductor. That's an interesting new system. I wonder how that's going to proximitize if you have superconducting aluminum trying to proximitize a semiconductor core. Well, here's what happens to superconductivity as a function of a magnetic field applied axially down the core of the wire. And let's just look at the shell for a minute. Let's not worry about what's going on in the core. Just put four leads on the shell, and let's just study what the shell does as a function of magnetic field applied axially and temperature, let's say. Here's the data. And I know it doesn't look like experimental data, but you have to believe me that this is experimental data. And that is, when it's black, zero resistance, it's superconducting. And there's these lobes of superconductivity that are destroyed in between. This is something that had been studied in a total of two other papers in the entire literature called destructive superconductivity. It was the, given that name by Dijen in the 1980s. And the destructive superconductivity says when there's this frustration of having a half a flux quantum, and the thing doesn't know whether to be diamagnetic this way or to admit one vortex and have the diamagnetism go the other way, you can generate sufficiently large currents around to try to expel the flux, that the current actually exceeds the critical current of the superconductor. And it drives it normal. So it drives it into some state. But in any case, it just becomes a metal here. And then if you get back, it says, oh, OK, fine. Now you're more than halfway. Now I'll round up. I'll let a vortex in. It was a normal metal. And I'll round up the other direction to get flux closure. And now I'll admit one vortex into the core. Or I can go here and I can admit two vortices into the core so that the wave function evolves twice as it goes around the loop. And in between, it drives itself normal, and there's a metal phase. So when we're in this particular state, this thing is like a, it's a vortex. We've just made a vortex. The wave function evolves once around. And now life gets interesting, because we have a different kind of superconductor. We have one kind of superconductor here, and a topologically distinct superconductor here. This one has zero 
nodes of the wave function, or uh, sorry, zero windings of the wave function as you go around. This one has one winding, this one has two windings, this one has negative one winding, negative two windings, etc. And that's how the shell responds accordingly. Now let's look and see what it does to the core. Oh, sorry. I want to do one thing first, which is a little bit of theory to say, what's that? Where does that come from? It's actually a pretty old theory. From 1961, Abrikosov and Gorkov wrote down this complicated equation involving digamma functions and logarithms for the critical temperature in the nth lobe. This was in the nth lobe, this is a kind of modern notation of, of the thing. This was not how they wrote it down. They were studying magnetic impurities, but I'll write it down in this particular case. Of the nth lobe at flux phi, and you need one quantity to go in there, which is called the so-called Cooper pair breaking parameter alpha. And what that parameter is, is this long, complicated thing that tells about the flux and how you have destroyed superconductivity from the flux. But look what's in it. The interesting thing about what's in it is that there's no free parameters. There's the area of the wire. There's the thickness of the shell. There's the flux. There's what lobe you're in. The only thing that you could call a free parameter, but it's not a free parameter, is, well, there's the, the zero flux, zero field critical temperature, the, the, the maximum right there at the very top. But we measure the gap, and so we can just figure what that is from BCS. So it's not even adjustable, but you can just take that number from the top. That's OK. And then one other thing, which is the coherence length. But the coherence length just depends on the resistance of the wire. The coherence length is just given by that orange color. So we know the orange color is 1.3 ohms or something like that. We know the thickness, and we know the diameter, so we know what the mean free path is. And that gives the coherence length as a function of Tc. And so we just plug all of that in, including what the critical current is. And lo and behold, that's abrikosov gorkov theory just plotted with no free parameters. And so, good, that's great. Hadn't been done before, but this is what I wanted because the last thing I wanted was for the shell to be interesting. So the shell is surprising maybe that it has these lobes and this destructive superconductivity, but it's 1961 physics. It's mean field theory. It works fine. By the way, if you make the diameter bigger, it doesn't need to be destructive. You could just have something which goes by the name of the little Parks effect, which is the modulation of, of the critical temperature as a function of the applied magnetic field. But the little Parks effect is allowed to go all the way to zero, which it does in the so-called destructive regime. But the theory knows about it. It's a different thickness or a different diameter, or whatever it is, and it just plots up just the same. No good. The shell is cool, but boring in a sense that it's described perfectly by the expected physics of mean field theory. But now let's look inside. So now I show you the other end of the wire where the shell is on and we do the tunneling spectroscopy just like this Delft experiment. You try to inject a normal electron in. If you look in the zero with lobe where the phase is uniform all the way around the shell, you just get good old proximity effect BCS superconductivity there's the density of states at the black cut. You just get induced gap. Nothing can inject down below zero. You go to the first lobe where there's a vortex. You've made the vortex yourself in the first lobe. And lo and behold, there's one zero energy state that survives. There's a lot of other states that live also in and around this vortex. These are the so-called coroli de Gen matricon states that people find around vortices. But the distinctive feature of an odd number of windings, and we have it also in 3 and 5, is one zero energy mode that lives inside of the system. There it is at the red cut. So this was a pretty surprising discovery. Well, maybe not. Now that I've kind of walked you down the garden path to uh, it's a vortex in, in, a, um, in a material that has strong spin-orbit coupling uh, that um, would create a Meyer on a zero mode. Uh, maybe it's not so surprising. But it was kind of nice when our numerics friends actually like modeled the system, put all the thicknesses in, made a very detailed model, including the, the dielectric and the gold and all of that stuff. And the theory plot ends up looking pretty much like what you'd expect with a trivial superconductor in the zeroth lobe and a trivial superconductor with one extra zero bias state in the first lobe. 
and where in the phase diagram you would get it as a function of chemical potential and diameter and some orbit coupling, where you would find uh, this uh, topological region. It's not everywhere, so you have to get the, get the parameters of the wire right, uh, but it was very nice to do it. By the way, we can survive one extra check. I'm looking at the time, and I'm going to, I'm kind of getting there. Yeah, okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me finish this up rather quickly. There's something else that I want to show you, and maybe I'll go a little faster than I ought to here because I want to get to one last topic. Let's do the thing again where we see whether these were really Majoranas at the end because they interact with each other, so we move them farther away. Now here, I can do the whole thing on one wire. There's all different length objects. Let's just look at the smallest one that's colored here. The smallest object is a Coulomb blockade island in the vicinity of zero magnetic field. The Coulomb blockade peaks are every other electron, 2E, Coulomb blockade. You get to the destructive regime. You destroy superconductivity. It's just a metal. The Coulomb blockade is every one. Then you go into the first low. Well, that's interesting. There's Coulomb blockade, and it looks sort of like 1E, except it looks like you know someone escaped through the prison bars. You know, like they, they, they kind of bent them a little bit. And they're not evenly spaced. In fact, if you kind of quantify it, here's the 2E, here's the normal metal, here's the 1E, where the even and odd are not evenly spaced, et cetera. And so now you have this measure that you might hope comes from the fact that those Majoranas are close to each other, distorting the prison bars and making the even and odd not the same spacing. So what do you do? You just move down the line to longer and longer and longer wires. And you see that, in fact, the prison bars become more and more regular as you go farther and farther away until you finally can't even see the even odd spacing anymore until you just plot how big the prison bar bending is as a function of the length of the wire and find that they fit just on that exponential again. It's good confidence. Let's check that box and move on. But it's cool that the vortex and the wire are the same thing. I, I just like that unification for me. Now, you might be thinking with your engineering hat on, if you have such an engineering hat, how's he going to build a quantum computer out of those little skinny wires? Is he going to really take them one at a time with a pair of tweezers and build the entire machine? And the answer is, I sure hope not. And this is where Javad comes in, and this is where the field lurches forward. Because the next revolution, just when we needed it, was to be able to take this epitaxial registry between a semiconductor and a metal that superconducts and extend it to two dimensions. And I will tell you that two dimensions is a lot more than one. <laughs> it's not just one more. It's a lot more than one. Because once you have a two-dimensional material, you can fabricate all the devices that you want using the same kind of processing that everyone makes chips out of. You can do top-down processing to make whatever you want. So that if I want to make a wire now, instead of picking up a wire and putting it down with a pair of tweezers and putting the things on the end and going and using the nanofab to make it, I define it lithographically. I make gates that define the wire. So there's a wire. There's the tunnel voltage into the end. All of the stuff is defined with lithography now, instead of by taking wire and putting it down. And there's this subgap state that goes to zero energy. And it's a long and interesting story. Um, but, the, but the important thing to point out is uh, that, uh, that, that this was something which was fabbed, not built. But once you can do things in two dimensions, a door opens up. And it's that la that's that door. If I take three or more minutes, I'm going to end with this, what's on the other side of that door? So you saw that we were able to make this kind of topologically locked Majorana mode. But there's nothing in particular about the going all the way around for the proximity effect that produced that topological state. In fact, what was really going on was frustration, was that this green thing in the middle didn't know what phase to pick up from its proximity effect. Should it become a phase that agrees here? Well, it's got the opposite phase on the other side. So maybe it wants to point in the opposite, have its phase in the opposite direction. And this whole thing, every time it tries to become superconducting, it's got someone on the other side telling it to have its phase in the opposite direction. But in fact, it doesn't need to go all the way around. This is enough frustration to completely frustrate the onset of superconductivity in this proximitizing problem. And what's 
freer, in fact, about the one on the right is that you can have any phase relationship between these two. It needn't be exactly pi, which frustrates the proximity effect. It can be anything in between. Whereas this one, by virtue of the topology of the circle, locks in the phase. So this one is, has a robustness, and this one has a freedom. And in fact, that problem was precisely studied in the literature, where you can take two superconductors, have a wire in the middle with width w, and you can have any phase you want across these two. And if you do what you did with the wire, which is put an axial magnetic field down, down this thing, this will, with the combination of the, the superconductivity, the axial magnetic field, and spin orbit coupling now in the two-dimensional material, produce, as this illustration indicates, Majorana zero modes at the ends of that junction. But now what's interesting is that the freedom that you have to have the phases be whatever you want, because it's now a planar geometry, says if you have them at pi and it's frustrated, you'll get at very low external magnetic field to topological state, whereas if you go to zero phase difference, you have to go back up to the trivial amount again. So now you just can walk in between the first problem and the second problem. The first problem made topology without Zeeman. The second one could make it either with Zeeman or without Zeeman, depending on the phase difference. So let's give it a try. It's a little harder. You have to put all these gates down. It's a two-dimensional problem. You have to make the junction. You have to find out whether there's a Majoran at the end by putting a quantum point contact at the end of the wire. You put the quantum point contact at the end. There it is. There's the quantum point contact. There's the junction. You put another thing in so that you can bias it depending on how you want. And you look for Majoran as in the presence of an in-plane magnetic field in, in this object. And there's more theory that I'll skip over. And here at zero magnetic field, you see the flux dependence that produces nothing interesting at the origin. You turn up the in-plane field, enter the topological phase, and the zero bias peak lights up like a Christmas tree. In fact, I'll zoom out a little bit and show you just the cuts at zero phase. There's the topological state. The gap closes at pi, uh, the, sorry, at, at this value of Zeeman field. It reopens with the zero bias peak. And suffice it to say, and I realize I'm out of time, the thing works like a charm. And now a whole new way of doing business opens up, not even necessarily this way, but just by taking advantage of the two-dimensionality uh, and the freedom that you have from that. So that, for instance, if you go to larger perpendicular magnetic field where you start to have nodes when you, when you exceed one flux quantum through the junction area itself, you have nodes that appear. So the topological phase is not just one big uh, triangle, but takes on multiple triangles, topological, trivial, topological, trivial, each of these punctuated by Majoran as it appear along the wire, you can now start controlling the positions of Majoran as using fluxes. So you turn up the flux and you move the Majoran as down this line as you move the boundary of the trivial and the topological regime. And so you can now start moving the Majoran as around, not by physically moving them in space, but by controlling the phases on this diagram. So, I have a whole other chapter that I, that I absolutely don't have time for, um, but I want to give you the spirit of where we are. We started off motivated by the idea that topology would make a robust qubit that would be immune to measurement. But I stopped going down that branch about halfway through this talk and instead turned my attention to interesting physics associated with the cores of vortices, the extension to SNS two-dimensional junctions, and a world of physics that has emerged because we were motivated to make topological objects using the standard tools of mesoscopic physics. And I think that we will be entertained by the quantum, commun quantum computing community as long as we stay true to our physics instincts uh, for a long time. And I think that um, someday I'll come back and give a talk about braiding and qubits and maybe that whole topological quantum computer. But in the meantime, there's a lot of fun and new physics to do. Thanks a lot. Any questions?
questions? I guess we have time for maybe one or two, and then we can go up, upstairs or downstairs, downstairs, downstairs <laughs> to continue there. Any question? Yeah. When, when you made that uh, that circuit where you were going to rotate the parity of your Majorana, yes. I thought that you were going to show then that you could basically move on the block sphere uh, by applying Me voltages too. and Me stuff. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, so what went wrong? You could ask what went wrong. Yeah, Why aren't you showing us that data? One more slide or something. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> well, I can I can tell you two things that happened. One is um, that there was a certain pretty stupid thing that was harder than we thought. Okay. And I mean, there were several things. That, I'll go in order from stupid to less stupid of things that happened. One, you want to open the gate so that you can connect and disconnect. Remember that when you close the gate, it's a charge detector. Now charge is a good quantum number on that island. You can read off the charge. When you open the gate, it's connected to ground. It's not a good charge detector, but it's still has parity preserved because it's connected to ground via a trivial superconductor. So far, so good, right? All sounds perfect. Here's the problem. When you close the gate, it's electrostatically coupled to the island. You go through about 50 Coulomb blockade peaks just in the electrostatics of closing the gate. Mm -hmm. So then you have to put a voltage on the other gate and say, every time I go like this with this one, I'm going to go like this with that one so that I walk down the ISO line of charge on the island would that those were straight diagonals, I could do that very easily. That got complicated. There's a better way to ground it, which is to use, the, there's a, is to do it in the 2D material, where you can put the grounder remote from the end of the wire. The, I was using the end of the wire for two things. I was using it, first of all, to ground the system, and second of all, to electrostatically do the control. Okay, mm -hmm. those should be separated, and we didn't have access to the 2D material at the mm -hmm. time that we would do it. So we have to go back now and do it again. Mm -hmm. There was a there was a, a less um, a, a stupid thing that happened, which was that it also relies on the fact that in that junction, there's myrona myrona coupling. When you lift up that middle barrier and you process around the block sphere, the rate at which you process is like. E Majorana over H. You know, there's a there's a frequency associated with that energy scale. And that and that turned out to be smaller than we thought. By just opening up the barrier and having a normal tunnel junction, we thought we would have gigahertz scale mm -hmm. splittings. And it turned out it wasn't gigahertz scale. And that we still don't understand. Mm -hmm. Why, when you make the electrostatics of that junction, do the Majoranas kind of stay away from each other? And it could just be that the density of the material changes so that they're you know, 200 nanometers away from each other, and that's already one E folding time for, the, for, for their interaction with each other, but they didn't process at the gigahertz rate that we wanted to, even after we solved the electrostatics problem. So, okay, two losses, and I'll tell you one win. There's a simpler version, which is called photon-assisted tunneling. And what you can do with photon-assisted tunneling is you can, you can set the two zero bias states at some energy, uh, call it E for a minute, and you can irradiate the thing at a frequency of E over, over Planck's constant. And when you do that, you can drive a single photon between these two energy states. As you move the two energy states, you can make a plot of frequency and energy, and you can see that I'm driving between two discrete states. That was a victory. Okay, and so that worked. And the photon-assisted tunneling between two Majorana states in that device was a success, and it's on the archive, and we're, it's going to be published in Nature Physics soon. And so we, we got that far because we're radiating at high frequency, but we haven't yet done the manual thing. And I have to swear that it's, it's really just kind of electrical engineering at this point. Just. I mean, electrical engineering makes the world go round. But I feel the physics is in our hands, mm -hmm. but all of this gating stuff just turned out to be harder than I thought. Thanks. Any other question? Okay. If not, this time Charlie again, have a good answer. My, 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 my buddy from New York.